Then depress the test button and hold it down. There. Just about 110 kilograms more indicated by each needle. That's a good test. The APU will draw fuel from the forward main tank at a rate of about 65 kilograms per hour and does not require a fuel boost pump to be running in order to function. But to prepare our fuel system for the imminent engine starts, let's turn on both the forward and aft fuel tank boost pumps by moving the respect switches up. We verify they're on by checking their green forward tank pump on and aft tank pump on lights on the right overhead panel. Let's close the cockpit door so the APU noise is minimized. We can only do this via a keyboard shortcut, so hit right control and the letter C. Now we have to open the APU shutoff valve to allow fuel flow into the APU. Let's go to the wall panel and uncap the APU switch, then flip the switch up. Let's make sure the valve is opened, so we turn our heads to the APU control panel and look for the green APU valve open light. Over on the engine startup control panel, we have a switch that's referred to as the startup crank false start selector. This switch allows us to control what will happen to either the APU or the engines when we hit the start button. As its name indicates, it has three positions. Start, crank, and false start, with start being the forward position. The start position is what is used for a normal APU or engine start. The crank position is used to spool the engines without dumping fuel into them. This will allow us to evacuate any residual fuel left over in the combustion chamber from a false or bad start, which is a mandatory step before attempting another start. The false start position is used mainly by maintenance to check the APU or engines, except without fuel ignition. We will take a look at the crank and false start procedures later on in this lesson, when in the abnormal procedures section. So, for now, let's position the switch to the start setting, if not already there. To the right of the startup crank false start selector, we find the engine selector switch. Since we only have one actual start button, over here, this switch will tell our start sequence what it is we are trying to start. This is a four position switch with the options being APU, left engine, right engine, and turbo gear. The three first choices are self-explanatory, but turbo gear will probably be unknown to most people. The turbo gear is a system that can be connected to the helicopter's main gearbox. It can then be powered by the APU bleed air, and its purpose is to energize the generators, as well as run hydraulic pumps to pressurize the hydraulic system, all with the engines off. This is done usually for maintenance checks, and always on the ground, as this option when active will disable the engine start. We will use the turbo gear later in the section to see how to set it up and cockpit indications. Back to the task at hand, starting the APU. The engine selector switch should already be set up to APU, but make sure. Now all that is left to do is hit the start button, but before we do, let's look at a couple of parameters we have to check during and after the start. During the start, the APU exhaust gas temperature, or EGT, which you can see over here in the APU control panel, cannot go above 850 degrees Celsius. It should also not take any longer than 24 seconds to reach standby mode. The APU will reach this standby automatically after the start, so once we hit the start button, we just monitor these parameters. We can keep track of the 24 seconds by using the clock on the left forward panel or the clock on the ABRUS. Since we don't have the ABRUS up yet, let's use the left forward panel clock. OK, hit the start button and let's monitor the time and the EGT. In three or four seconds, you will hear the APU spooling up, the EGT rising, and you should see the green APU oil pressure normal light on. In about 10 or 12 seconds, you should see the APU on light, which indicates the start sequence has ended. Take a quick look at the clock and note the time. Notice that the EGT will keep on rising for a bit after the start sequence has finished and the APU is up and running. That's normal. Just make sure it stabilizes anywhere below 720 degrees Celsius, which is the maximum EGT for continuous APU operations. 
In most conditions, your APU EGT should be around 600 degrees Celsius as it is right now. Notice that unlike most commercial applications, our APU in the KA-50 does not provide electrical power to the helicopter. It is used solely to provide bleed air to spool the engines during their start sequence. It's important to note the time at which point the APU on light over here came on, especially if we're in a hurry, as the APU bleed is not to be used for engine start for one minute after APU start. This is a very common procedure with APUs in aircraft, and it's done to allow the temperature inside the APU turbine to stabilize before putting a load on the unit. If no wait time is allowed, the APU turbine blades will crack and break much sooner than their expected life cycles. So, while the APU warms up, let's perform a test of the exhaust gas temperature, or EGT gauges. There are two possible tests, but only one is designed to be performed with the engines off. We will get to the second one after the engines are running. The EGT gauges are located on the right forward panel, to the right of the Abrus. Click and hold the Stop Test Push button, which is over here, and watch both left and right EGT gauges wind up their indications. The test is successful with an indication of 800 degrees Celsius or higher, and it looks pretty good. Ours is at 825 right now. After checking this indication, you can let go of the test push button. So we are now ready for our first engine start. We will start the left engine, stabilize it, check its parameters, then start the right engine. The first step here is to check and make sure that our collective is in its full down position as we don't want to put any stress on the engines before they're fully started. Let's turn off the rotor brake, which keeps our rotors from rotating freely in the wind when the helicopter is unattended or when personnel are working on the chopper and the engines are off. We disable it by clicking on this black lever below the engine fuel cutoff levers. There is no indicator in the cockpit that the rotor brake is off, except for the position of the lever, so become familiar with it. The brake is off when the lever is in its down position. The rotor brake is part of the start protection logic checks. If it's enabled, the engine startup will not happen as there would be dire consequences to either the brake itself, the power turbine, or both. The next step is to open the associated engine fuel shutoff valve. Before we do, let's take a look at the right overhead panel. Notice that there are two yellow caution lights on, left hand valve closed and right hand valve closed. These lights are indicators of the position of these valves and will extinguish as soon as we open them. So, let's go to the wall panel and uncap the fuel shutoff left, then flip the switch up and recap it as this valve will stay on for as long as the engine is running. Make sure the left hand valve closed light has extinguished on the overhead panel. So now we need to enable the Electronic Engine Governor, or EEG. The EEG protects the engine in two different fashions, one for the gas generator, the other for the power turbine. The gas generator protection is related to maximum RPM. If more than maximum RPM is detected, the EEG will start limiting fuel flow to that engine to maintain the gas generator RPM below 101%. The power turbine protection is due to an overspeed. The EEG has two detection channels for this. If both channels detect a power turbine overspeed within 0.2 seconds of each other, the EEG will command an automatic engine shutdown. You may think this is a bit abrupt, especially if it happens in flight, in the middle of combat, but allowing the power turbine to overspeed will guarantee a catastrophic engine failure, so the safest thing to do is shut her down and allow the pilot to continue on the other engine. Okay, still on the wall panel, let's uncap the left hand EEG and turn it on. And check that both EEG test switches next to it are showing through their caps, which means they are in the operational position. Go ahead and recap the left hand EEG. With fuel ready to be provided to the left engine and the engine governor online, we can initiate its start. Change the engine selector switch to the engine left hand position and let's briefly discuss what we will look for during the engine's pull up and start. Within two or three seconds after we press the start button, we will look for a gas generator RPM needle jump from zero to about 